series on masterpieces. This is actually the final week, and man, this has been an interesting series for me personally. I don't know if you've enjoyed it, but I've enjoyed it because this is a series unlike I've ever done where we've been exploring different artists and different pieces of art that they have created and lessons, perhaps, that we can learn from these artists. And uh, we, we started out, we talked about um, Vincent Van Gogh, and then we talked about Michelangelo. Last week we talked about Rembrandt, and if you want to catch up on any of those, you can do that online at thrive.church. Uh, we have all the archives there. So this week we're going to be continuing, uh, and we're going to be talking about Leonardo Da Vinci. Leonardo Da Vinci, one of the most famous artists of all time. When people talk about a real Renaissance man, there's debate over who the ultimate perfect Renaissance man was, whether it was Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci. Man, this guy was an incredible guy. He was born in 1452. So he was born long ago, and he was an illegitimate child of a lawyer. So there was a very well, uh, well-known, prestigious lawyer in the town of Vinci, and, and he had this illegitimate child and they named him Leonardo. At the age of 13, uh, before that, he kind of he lived with his mom for a while. Then he moved back in with his dad. His dad set up an apprenticeship for him at 13 years old where he began to work with uh, some master artists learning the trade, learning how to paint, how to sculpt, how to do all kinds of things like that. Uh, after about seven years, when he was 20 years old, he was considered a master by the Guild of St. Luke, which was kind of the, the, the local guild for artists. He was considered the highest level. He was a master artist. But we all know that Leonardo da Vinci is much more than just simply an artist. Not only was he an artist, but he was also an inventor. Uh, Connecticut Science Museum uh, had for a while some displays of, of recreations of his inventions. He was obviously a painter. He was a sculptor. He was an architect. He, he, he mastered several sciences. He was a musician. He was a mathematician. He was an engineer. He wrote literature. He explored and discovered parts of the human anatomy. He was a master of anatomy. He was a master of geology and botany and history and writing and astronomy and map making and all kinds of things. There is a lot that our civilization uh, you know, has uh, received as benefits from the early discoveries of Leonardo da Vinci. In fact, some call him the father of paleontology. Many also call him the father of architecture. Building buildings, not just for function, but also with a beautiful form as well. He's been credited with the invention of the parachute and the helicopter and the tank and solar power and the adding machine um, amongst a bunch of other inventions that probably didn't work. But he invented them nonetheless. Man, he was a mastermind. But it's interesting, we know him often for the paintings that he did. And although he painted for his entire life, there's only about 15 paintings that have survived. However, there's about 13,000 pages of journal entries that he wrote over his, the period of his life. And I find it interesting that he wrote them, he was left-handed, and he would write them in what's called mirror image cursive. So he would write with his left hand in cursive backwards from the right to the left. Um, so obviously, it took people a while to be able to decipher all of this. They thought he was doing it for secrecy, but, uh, but later on, they just kind of determined that he did it just because it was more convenient for him. I don't know why that would be convenient, but that is what he did. So he had many paintings, and, and probably the most famous painting in the world, we've all seen it, of course, we'll see it now, is the Mona Lisa. Man, what an amazing painting. The interesting thing about this painting, and, and people have, have talked about her expression of her mouth for, for, for centuries. They've talked about this and how you can't entirely tell if she's smiling or if she's not smiling. And, and when you look at it different ways, it shows different reflections. I've heard some people claim that it took up to four years just for him to perfect her smile. 
Man, he was a master. Another painting that this is the most famous piece of religious painting. It's more reproduced than any other painting is The Last Supper. The one we were just alluding to a few moments ago in the skit. The Last Supper. And this painting has been uh, reproduced time and time again. The problem with this painting is that, um, that he painted it and he wanted the colors to be more vibrant. So instead of using the, uh, the, the, the typical techniques, he actually let the plaster dry and he coated it with all these things so the, so the colors would be more brilliant. And, and it's hard to get the scale of what we're looking at, but just as a reference, that little tan square in the bottom, that's actually a doorway. So this is a massive, massive painting. And it's there. And it was only a few years after he finished the painting that it started to degrade. It started to degrade, it started to flake after about 10 years, and in 50 years, they say the entire painting was unrecognizable. They couldn't even realize it. A uh, hundred years later, they built a brick wall to cover the entire thing. After that, they pulled the brick wall down, they cut a doorway in it, and, uh, and then they would just use it for that. They covered it with curtains for a while, thinking that they were protecting it. However, they were trapping moisture in on it. Whenever they would move the curtains, it would scrape off more paint. It has been restored several times over the last, say, 500 years, and, and to different levels of success each time. Sometimes the restorations actually destroyed it more than they helped. The most recent one that we've done, probably about 30 years ago, and, and that restoration, they actually went and tried to reverse all of the previous restorations, but even still, the painting was degraded so much that it was hard to get the, the full view of what it actually was. So this is a painting of the Last Supper. But before we get to the Last Supper, let's rewind just a little bit the story. Because we're here celebrating Palm Sunday. So we're going to rewind the story just a little bit, just a couple days, and we're going to look in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 12, it says this, The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and people whip out these palm branches. They're waving the branches around. They're saying, Hosanna. They're throwing the palm branches on the ground. It says they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. They took palm branches. Why do we have Palm Sundays? Because we're remembering what happened then. But palms are very significant. Palms are are, are traditionally used in that time, in that era, to cover the road when somebody like a king or someone that deserved high honor would be coming through. They would take palm branches and they would lie them on the ground in, in, in a way of saying, we want to honor you, honor you in such a way that the, that the animal you're riding on, their feet is not even touching the ground, but you're touching the palm leaves instead. So they would, they would throw these down. Palms were, you can put this in your notes, palms were a symbol of victory and peace. Psalms were, palms were the symbol of peace, of, of, of triumph. They were a, 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 a symbol of, of eternal life. These palms were this symbol as they came in and they're throwing them down. In fact, in ancient Greece, we know that Palms were awarded to a victorious athlete. Man, if you just ran a race, they would make a, 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 a crown out of palms that you would wear showing that you are triumphant, you are victorious. It, it signals the end to a conflict. It sin, signals the end to a competition. The competition is over. We now have our winner and we're crowning him with palms. When a Roman lawyer would win a case uh, in the courts, he would go and he would hang palm leaves on his front door as a signal of victory. I won. If you were looking for a lawyer in the Roman days, you would go around looking to see who had palm leaves hanging on their door because you knew that they were a successful lawyer. And they shouted Hosanna. They shouted, shouted praises to God. 
They said, save us, Lord. It says they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail the King of Israel. Everyone loves a parade, don't they? Man, we love parades. We, we, we like to go to parades, the Macy's Parade. Parades are awesome. You know, the, the, uh, in 1896, Charles Lindbergh, he had just made a first successful solo flight over the Atlantic Ocean. He came and they had a ticker tape parade, a parade where they dropped down at that point 357 tons of ticker tape paper. You can go online, you can see it. It's, it's amazing how much paper they're dropping. But the biggest ticker tape parade of all time was John Glenn when he returned from orbiting the Earth. They dropped 3,474 tons of ticker tape over a seven-mile path. Man, that's a big mess to clean up. So what they were doing, they didn't have ticker tape then, but they had palm branches, and they're throwing down palm branches. They're waving palms, saying, Hosanna is the king. Hosanna, Hosanna. It says that he rode in on a donkey. Actually, on a colt of a donkey. He rode in on a donkey. And, and you can write this in your notes. That, uh, that There was tradition that a king would ride on a horse when he was coming into a city in war. But he would ride in on a donkey when he was coming in peace. The king would ride on a horse when he's saying, I'm here to fight but ride on the donkey. And this is very symbolic of Jesus. When Jesus was riding in, he was riding not to declare war on the Roman Empire, not to declare war on anybody, but he came riding on a donkey, symboling that he's coming riding in peace. Jesus came as a prince of peace, not as a war-raging king. He came to bring peace to us. So here come Jesus and the disciples. They're strolling in. Man, these guys are like celebrities. Peter, who we know later on, denied Jesus three times. Man, what's Peter saying now? He's like, yeah, guys, I'm with him. I'm with him. They're all like, yeah, they're cheering. Yeah, we're with Jesus. A few short days later, he would deny that he even ever met him. But right now, they're celebrating. Judas, man, he's going along with the crowd too. I mean, he wanted an uprising, and now Jesus is coming in. Man, the uprising is about to begin, is what's going through his mind. And, but see, the thing of it is, is sometimes in life, we don't get what we want. And when we don't get what we want, we start to turn on Jesus. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. When you're not getting what you want in life, and you start to turn your back on Jesus... These disciples, they were willing to fight for Jesus, but they weren't entirely ready to turn the other cheek for him. They were willing to go in and fight the Roman government, but they didn't want to come in and be peaceful about it. Palm Sunday was full of expectation. Man, things are about to start happening. But soon something began to change. People, they weren't believing that Jesus was the Messiah. The religious leaders, there was murmurs that they were plotting to kill Jesus. And Jesus himself started talking about dying and drinking his blood and eating his body. They gathered together to celebrate Passover. And as they're together, as all the, the disciples Coming in, Jesus kneels in a sign of servanthood and he washes the, the, the feet of all the disciples, Judas included, washing the feet of the person who is going to betray him in just a few hours. And this is the scene that Da Vinci painted, the Last Supper. You know, some of us have heard Da Vinci Code, and man, he got some crazy claims, but you know what? It's fiction. It's fiction. They're like, oh, the guy on his, you know, over here to the left is actually Mary Magdalene. No, it's not. It's John. And in and, and, and religious art back then, they were always depicting John as the youngest of the 12 disciples without a beard. So it was John. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci said clearly in his journals that it was John. So I don't know what the guy was talking about, but he made a lot of money in the process. But here's, here's the, the Last Supper. I don't think they were all sitting in a line. But here is his depiction of it. But this depicts a very specific moment. 
It doesn't just depict the entire meal. It depicts a very specific moment. And we'll read about that moment in John 13, 21. It says, Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering, whom could he mean? The disciple Jesus loved, this is John, he's talking about himself. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Verse 24, Simon Peter motioned to him and asked, who is he talking about? So if we look at that, we can zoom in a little bit, and we'll see uh, the, the, the disciples Peter, that's his head in the middle, he's talking to John, saying, who is he talking about? Who is he talking about? Who is going to betray him? Who would have the nerve to betray Jesus? Verse 24 again, it says, Simon Peter motioned to him and said, Who's he talking about? The disciple leaned over to Jesus and says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus responded, It's the one who I give the bread, I dip in the bowl. And when he dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said, Hurry up and do what you're going to do. We can zoom in. We'll see Judas there. How do we know it's Judas? He's holding a money bag right there in his, uh, in his right hand. He's the one that would be betraying Jesus with a kiss. Man, the name Judas, th this carries a lot of weight, man. I mean, th this is the thing that you don't name your kid Judas. And I always had a problem with that because my name is Judah. <laughs> and so people are like, Hey, Judas. I'm like, what do you think my parents were thinking? Come on, my name's not Judas, it's Judah, which is a big difference, but regardless, they call me Judas anyhow, and I've been getting it all my life. Never name your child Judas, please. Um, but uh, but here's, here's Judas, uh, and, and he's known for his, his betrayal. Things weren't happening the way Judas wanted them to. He's thinking, this is not what I signed up for. I signed up to, to, bring, to bring liberty to the Jews, to make a revolution so that we could be a world power. And here he's talking about dying. We don't exactly know what went through Judas's mind. We don't know if he was just trying to prompt Jesus to put him in a situation where Jesus would show his power. We don't know if Judas was mad. We don't know what the deal is. But we know that he betrayed him. He betrayed him. Did, G did Jesus approve of this betrayal? No, absolutely not. Jesus knew, though, write this in your notes, that sometimes you have to go through betrayal before you can get through victory. For some of you, maybe you need to hear this. Sometimes you have to go through betrayal before you can make it to victory. Jesus had to go through betrayal before he could get to the resurrection. If it wasn't for the betrayal, we wouldn't have the eternal life. Judas, though, he was willing to trade his relationship with God, his relationship with Jesus, for a bag of coins. For a bag of coins. And I wonder, in our lives, what are we willing to trade our relationship with God for? Are we willing to trade it for a bag of coins? Maybe a, a, a few coins, like, oh... For some money, I'm willing to trade my relationship with God for, for a little bit of money. Or maybe you're willing to, to trade your relationship with God for, for a relationship that you know sh you shouldn't be in. You know it's dragging you down. You know that this person doesn't believe the same way. But you're like, but I, I, just, I just love him and, and, and he's so cute or she's so hot and I just want to be with him. And I'm willing to trade my relationship for that. I'm willing to trade my relationship with God for... For, for a job, because I really want that, and I know that maybe God doesn't really approve of all that they're asking me to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm trading it for that. Maybe you're trading your relationship with God for peer pressure. You're around people, and they're talking in ways that maybe they shouldn't be talking. They're talking about things that aren't glorifying God, and you're like, I'm just going to go along with it because I'm willing to trade my relationship to impress my friends. 
Man, what are we willing to sell our promise for? We look all throughout the Bible. We see people that were willing to sell their promise, to trade their promise. We saw that Esau was willing to sell his promise for a bowl of soup. We saw Samson was willing to trade his promise for a girl. We saw Saul. He was willing to trade his promise for some spoils of war. We saw Moses was willing to trade his promise out of anger because he wanted to hit the rock instead of speak to it. We saw the ten spies. They were willing to trade their promise out of fear because they were afraid of the giants in the land. We see Balaam was willing to trade his promise just because of some promises of some money and some power. We see Judas was willing to trade his relationship with God for 30 pieces of silver. What are you willing to trade your promise for? What are you trading it for? See, Jesus promised there was a kingdom. There was a kingdom that was coming, but it wasn't coming fast enough for Judas. And I wonder sometimes if we're too anxious for the end of our story. We're in the middle of the story. We're in the middle of the story and we're just so anxious to see what's going to happen that we decide we need to take things into our own hands and make things happen on our own. And that's what was going on here. Judas is like, Jesus, you're not moving quick enough. I'm going to help move things along a little bit. Are we too anxious? Are, are we patient for God's promise to come to pass? What we want is we want, the, we want the grand finale without the journey. We want to get to that grand finale, but we don't want to go through the journey to get there. We want to have the climax of the story without the conflict. No story is good without conflict, but we want to avoid it. And Jesus is saying, here, you're coming through some conflict. You're coming through some difficult times in your life. And we're saying, no, just get me to the climax. And I'm going to speed this up if I have to. And that's what Judas was doing. I wonder if we ever try to play God. You know, I don't mean like pretend that we are God. I mean try to, try to, try to play him, you know, try to get one over on him. Oh God, I'll do this if you do that. Or God, I bet if I do this, it, it, you know, you'll do something here. If you were really God, you would do this. And we try to manipulate God. Man, God can't be manipulated. So we try to bargain with God. Here's three ways in our life that we, we betray God. First one is that we betray Him by trusting in things rather than Him. We're trusting in things rather than Him. In Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord. Actually, just 3, uh, 3 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. Put Him first. Are we trusting in the Lord or are we trusting in things? Are we trusting in our wisdom? Are we trusting in our job? Are we trusting in our schooling? Are we trusting in our education? Are we trusting in our relationship? Or are we trusting in God? It says trust in the Lord with all of your heart. The second way that we betray Him is we betray Him when we rebel against Him. Rebelling is an act of defiance or carelessness towards an authority. Saying, I'm rebelling against you. Scripture says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And we're rebelling against God. We feel like God is pulling us one way and we're saying, no, I'm going to go another way. I'm going to do this. We feel like God is saying, hey, I want you to do this, this, and this in your life. And we're like, no, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. The third way is that we betray him when we want something else more. When we want something else more more, when we want money more, we want relationship more, we want job more, we want acceptance from our peers more, we want education more, we want any of these things more, we say, I want this more, I'm willing to trade that for my relationship with God. I'm willing to betray Jesus, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, for a little bit of silver. What are we willing to betray God for? Let's spin this around, though. I wonder if you've ever been betrayed before. You ever been betrayed? Anyone been betrayed? Some of you guys. Don't elbow the person next to you if you're sitting next to them. <laughs> Man, we've been betrayed. How does that feel? That, that's low, isn't it? I mean, this is like the lowest thing possible. When you feel betrayed. But you know the interesting thing about betrayal is betrayal can't happen without love, can it? Betrayal can't happen without love. Write this down that an attack comes from an enemy, but betrayal comes from someone close. 
Betrayal comes when somebody's close to you. And that's what Judas was. Judas, I mean, Judas was a guy that was man in the money. He was counting the money that they had. He was taking care of the physical needs of the disciples. He was there. He was trusted. And that's why the betrayal was so bad. It comes from somebody that's close. But let me tell you this. Jesus wasn't caught off guard by Judas' betrayal. He wasn't caught off guard by that. And he's not caught off guard when we are betrayed in our life. And when we go through difficulties and hard times, he's not caught off guard. Because sometimes pain serves the purpose of bringing us closer to God, of bringing about God's plan in our life. Write that down. Sometimes pain serves as this purpose. This pain served a purpose. It was because of Judas' betrayal that Jesus was led to the cross to be crucified, to die on the cross, and that's why we have Easter, because the grave couldn't hold Jesus any longer. So, so Jesus, think about this. Jesus, when he was picking his 12 disciples, he's like, I want you. I want you. And I know you're going to betray me, but I want you anyway. I want you to come and be my disciple. Jesus knew this was going to happen. In John 13, 27, we read it a moment ago, that says Satan entered Judas. Satan, he wanted to destroy God's plan. He wanted this whole thing to fall apart. Satan wanted Jesus to die. Absolutely. That was his plan. He entered Judas and said, we are going to win. We're going to get him killed. But Satan wanted to destroy God's plan. But guess what? Satan's plan actually pushed God's plan forward, didn't it? Man, if it wasn't for that, Jesus didn't have a way to get to the cross. And I wonder, what is the devil doing in your life right now to wreck your life? What what kind of pain is he stirring up? What kind of betrayal is Satan stirring up in your own life? What What kind of storms are you going through in your life? And you feel like you're being attacked, you're being attacked. And it's so easy to look at this attack and not realize that maybe that is the very thing that's pushing us to where God wants us to go. Imagine that if this hard time, this this relationship situation, this financial problem that you're going through, this failure, this, this moral problem that you're facing, this sickness, what if that attack is the very thing God is using to push you forward in your relationship with God? In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said this to his brothers. He says, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good. He brought me in this position so I could save lives and many people. And man, when we come into these situations in life, when we come in these battles, when we come in betrayal, man, when you're betrayed, I've been betrayed, we've all been betrayed by people, and it cuts. It's like a knife stab in the back, and we feel this betrayal, but we can look at this and we can say, what the devil intends for evil, what our enemy intends for evil, God is going to turn it around for good. What Judas intended for evil, through the power of Satan, what he intended for evil, God turned it around for good and said, you're playing right into my plan. Just like he's playing chess, and he's five moves ahead. You ever play people like that? You can't win, because they're already thinking ahead. And God's like, yeah, you go ahead, Judas. You go ahead and betray my son. Yeah, you go ahead, Satan. You, you convince Judas to take this. But you intend this for evil, but I got a backup plan. It's not even a backup plan. It's a plan A where Jesus is going to die on the cross. You're going to think that you won, but the grave can't hold him anymore. So what the enemy intends for evil, God turns it around for good. It's like this story. I'm going to close with this story, man. I love this story. About a guy and he had a donkey. It wasn't the one Jesus rode in town on. This was, a, this was an old donkey and the donkey fell down in a well. So the donkey's at the bottom of the well and the farmer looks down at the donkey and they're trying to figure out how can we get the donkey out of the well? And they can't figure out how to get the donkey out of the well. So the old farmer says, you know what? It's an old donkey anyhow. I don't really care about that donkey to be honest with you. You know what let's do? 
Let's just bury him alive. I mean, what a nice guy, right? We're just going to bury this donkey alive. So they, they start saying, okay, let's go for it. And they grab, you know, they get on their shoulder, they start digging, they start throwing dirt in there, they start throwing dirt in there. And guess what that donkey's down there doing? He's getting dirt, laying it on his back, laying it on his head. You know what he does? The donkey shakes off his head, and he takes a step up. And they throw him more dirt, and he shakes off his head, and he takes a step up, and they keep filling in this well. Before long, the donkey walks out of the well. The very thing that was intended to bury him was the thing that saved the donkey. And sometimes, right, the thing that's supposed to bury you is the very thing that's going to get you out of that well. And when things come, the stuff hits us, we just shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up like the great theologian Taylor Swift said. Because the player's going to play, 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 play. And the hater's going to hate, 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 hate. But baby... I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. I shake it off, and I shake it off. So when we are betrayed, when we are betrayed, we need to shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up. Jesus was betrayed just the way we are. We need to shake it off. Whatever's coming at us, these hardships that we're facing in our life, shake it off and step up. Father, we come to you, and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word, which is powerful. We thank you for the lessons that we can learn from even the bad guys. Lord, help us not to betray you. Let us not sell our relationship to you for a few coins or a relationship or a job or to impress people. Let us not sell our relationship for that. And Lord, when people betray us, when people turn against us, help us to shake it off and step up. When things come our way, when the storms of life come, we know that you're in the boat with us. Help us to move forward. Help us to realize that the pain that we're experiencing now may be the very thing that brings us the deliverance that we're hoping for. As we continue to pray, maybe you're here and, and you've never crossed that line of faith. You don't have Jesus as, as the priority in your life. And then what a great time to do it. Scripture says that any of us that call in the name of the Lord will be saved. And if that's where you are, I would just say call out to him. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my Lord. And then let's follow him. Yeah, sometimes we go through hard times, but he's there with us. He gives us the power to move forward. Lord, we put our trust, our hope, our future in you. In Jesus' name, amen.